and welcome to a discussion on the topic, Religion and Daily Life. Being a person of the present era, you will find that questions regarding the impact of religion on our lives have become commonplace today. How we, the modern people, relate to religiosity and spirituality have also become matters of great importance. But at the same time, many sociologists have diverted their attention and uh, interest to places other than religion. Yet religion intersects with almost all aspects of modern life. What we see today is increasing inclination towards de-differentiation that questions several conjectures and one of the most important of them is perhaps the assertion made by Jose Casanova, a leading scholar in the sociology of religion. Casanova said that the differentiation and emancipation of secular spheres from religious institutions and norms remains a modern structural trend. I will be coming to the concept of differentiation and de-differentiation a bit later, where I'll be speaking on the welfare and religion using the European perspective. Before that, I would like to talk about two very important aspects of human life, the first being health. The subject of health and religion can be exemplified through discussion on birth and death, things that are considered to be the most holy or sacred moments of the human experience. Often, there are queries regarding whether these two, that is birth and death, should be exclusively interpreted in medical terms or whether they should be studied from a religious perspective. The funny part is, is that modernist answers to such questions pave the path for even more rattling questions about these sacred moments of human life. You see, de-differentiation is both an individual and an institutional matter of concern. What is important is well-being, because it is in this concept of well-being that our body, mind, and spirit all play their particular roles. Let me now come to a brief discussion on gender and age. As you see, despite being an important area of concern, the subject of gender was largely neglected for many decades. It was only recently that this field was given its due and adequate attention. So much so that the difference of religious life between men and women also grabbed a lot of attention. A parallel shift has also taken place in the field of age, which in turn has opened the range of possibilities considering religious change. Now this can both be considered in terms of the individual or in terms of the society or in terms of both the individual and society. Whichever way it is, any discourse on age will inevitably lead us to the question of death. And let me tell you that matters of death and existentialism were very much impervious to the idea of secularism. Of course, there cannot be a sufficient reason why this should still be not the case in the age of late modernity. come to a discussion on the concept of differentiation and de-differentiation. In this regard, I will be speaking of WREP, that is welfare and religion in a European perspective. At the beginning of this section, let me state that there are a number of disparities between Europe and America in terms of religion. For example, in Europe, there existed a state church, which is now absent. And in the United States, there is no state-sponsored church such as like Europe. That is why, while the Europeans resort to the state for support in times of need, as it is responsible for their welfare, in the case of Americans, this is not true. Of course, not all countries in Europe enjoy the same welfare regime. The process occurs differently in different European societies, and thus there are characteristic welfare regimes in different European countries. If I'm to speak of the WREP project, I should state about the comparative project on religion and welfare that was conducted in eight European societies. 
The study showed that in Nordic countries, that is in the countries lying in the northern part of Europe, Lutheran churches delegated the role of social welfare to the state. As a result, welfare is delivered quite easily. On the other hand, in France, which is part of the southwestern part of Europe, the state wants to control both the fields of welfare and well-being, as well as moral authority, functions that previously belonged to the church. In Catholic Europe, Catholic social teaching through subsidiary is noteworthy. Welfare is bequeathed to the family, a situation which is familiar in Greece. Thus, what we can see, in many ways, welfare has been separated from the church and it has formed an autonomous sphere of its own. Despite this, it is also clear from the studies conducted for the WREP project that Europeans prefer the state taking up responsibility for social welfare for them. But then there came a time when most European nations faced severe economic crises and high levels of unemployment. This began in the 1970s and onwards. Not only was this economy in danger, but the demography too became alarming with the rise in the number of proportion of elderly people in the population. Consequently, the sufficiency of welfare services and their finances were in doubt. Questions such as whether there'd be enough economically active people to support the economically dependent arose, so did whether it would be poss possible to meet the needs of educational prolongation in the post-industrial economy. This was all thanks to the turmoil in Europe. Thus, no longer was it viable to maintain the requirements of welfare state in the same way as it was earlier met. No longer was the state the provider for, of welfare for its people. So as you can see, if the state can no longer provide an all-inclusive system of welfare to its people, it is inevitable that the churches will have to take over that responsibility. Now, if we study the early results of the WREP project, we can notice something very interesting. The factors that were present in the time of incipient differentiation of responsibilities are still found when the new situation emerges. In other words, the process of de-differentiation is as culturally precise as its precursor. Thus, the possibility of comparatively easier revival of the welfare role by churches in certain countries of Europe appears to be a difficult one. So for instance, if we consider the example of France, which is largely controlled by the secular state, public authorities seemed unwilling to cooperate in the project dealing with religion. While in Finland, because of the recession caused by the collapse of the Russian market in the early 1990s, the welfare role was largely undertaken by churches, which in turn escalated their popularity too. Thus, as you see, what is actually needed is a successor to, to the WREP project that would help us to know about the conditions in Europe in more detail. Particularly, what is needed is an evaluation of the minority religions in Europe, like that of Islam, and also the evaluation of communist countries where the state and the church occupy different roles and positions. Moving on, you will also find that health and health care is another important example of differentiation and de-differentiation. In this respect, birth and death, sacred moments of human existence, will now be discussed as the starting point of this debate. Let me first talk about the history of childbirth. You see, in pre-modern societies, childbirth was a very risky process. In fact, it is still considered to be quite risky in most of the developing countries of the world. Why only in developing countries? Historically, even in Europe, there is evidence showing that a large number of young women have lost their lives during childbirth. And the worst part is, is that preparation for childbirth was actually preparation for their own death. 
Suffice it to say, the procedure of childbirth was not only a matter of concern in the field of medical knowledge, but was also largely a matter of concern for religious rites and rituals. And to validate this, I can incite the instance of churching of women, where God is thanked for the safe deliverance from great pain and peril of childbirth. Gradually, over time, this situation has changed, thanks to the progress in the field of medical science, which includes a combination of antibiotics, safe surgery, and the like. And perhaps this is why, in the present day, the death of a mother while giving birth to her baby is no longer a matter of great concern in the West. So as you might understand, this is actually a matter of great relief for the mothers to be across the world. Now let me speak about an interesting point here. Today, women have the tendency to complain that the experience of childbirth is not too different from the assembly line in a Fordist factory. This speaks to the progressive loss of control of the women herself. So what happens is that to restore their control, some women, mostly middle-class women, prefer to give birth at home rather than in a hospital, and they seem to be unwilling to follow hospital routines and medical requirements. This kind of re-evaluation has become an important body of literature where comparative research has a major role to play. Next, let me come to the topic of abortion. You see, there are a number of questions that have been raised regarding the subject of childbirth, like who will decide whether to have a child or not, whether childbirth is a moral process or a medical process, is it a personal matter or a sacred matter? All of these and other questions come to mind. Interestingly, these kinds of questions were raised particularly during the debates surrounding abortion in the United States. Abortion, as you might know, is the cessation of pregnancy or fetal development. It is an important issue in American politics and lobbyists that pressure the decision-making process. Gradually, there is a shift in the de abortion debate from a matter of justice for women to a matter which is more concerned with the right to life of the fetus. So, this actually reflects the various transformations that took place in American society, changes that show how moral issues and not socioeconomic issues have become more important and more dominant. Let's talk about the right to life and the conflict between the right to life and the right to choose by stepping away from the abortion debate to a discussion of the right to die. You may have heard of the famous Terry Schiavo case in the United States that lasted for almost 15 years, from 1990 to 2005. Teresa Marie Schiavo, better known as Terry Schiavo, was an American woman, an insurance clerk by occupation, and in 1990, at the age of 26, suffered a cardiac arrest, which in turn led to permanent brain damage. As a result, she needed constant care and attention. Initially, she was kept in a rehabilitation center and then later transferred to a nursing home. Eight years later, in 1998, her husband, Michael Schiavo, appealed to the courts to remove Terry's feeding tube because she was in a persistent vegetative state. What followed was a long and complex chain of events where family members argued about Michael's decision. The case moved from the court to a senior political figure also became involved in the case. Ultimately, in 2005, all legal options available to Terry Schiavo's pa parents were depleted, and the feeding tube was removed for the third and final time, causing Terry's demise within a few days. If you are familiar with this case, then you might know that it has become a burning issue in the media and even a matter of great political concern. The George W. Bush administration also made attempts at transforming the federal court ruling in this matter, 
Bush himself flew to wa from Washington to Palm Beach to sign the bill so that you can understand the importance of this case. What I also need to stress is the role of churches in this case. The church organized observances demanding that Schiavo be granted the right to live. They made Schiavo a martyr and was explicitly shown by the media. So ultimately what happened was a blurring of boundaries between public and private as the political, religious, and moral worlds all interfered in the Schiavo case. As you can see, the Schiavo case is an American one, very much debatable and unusually public. It shows the problem faced by modern society, the problem of coming to terms with moral questions that come to the forefront at a time when medical techniques allow the continuance of physical life after the brain has stopped working or the sustenance of a premature baby on one hand and a late abortion on the other. Maybe that is why the American weekly magazine Time, in regard to the Schiavo case, came up with the burning question and they asked, the end of life, who decides? Regardless of what we personally believe about religion, it remains a very important institution in secular societies. Now having spoken of health and health care in present societies with reference to American societies and citing an important example, I would now like to move on to speaking about the route from welfare to that of well-being. Here, I will speak of a connection between material things of the new age and that of self-spirituality. You see, as people today shop for products and services that are useful for their body, mind, and spirit, well-being automatically becomes a lifestyle choice. Health foods, beauty products, organic products, spa treatments, self-help manuals, and the like have become a large part of our daily life. This implies that there is no demarcation, rather differentiation between the different aspects of our body, mind, and between home and work. Today, we consult a healer and also a doctor. This is because the boundaries between healing and therapy have merged. Today, spiritual goods are also being bought and sold in the same way other products are. And interestingly, women are more prone to buying such products than men. So you might note that the search for well-being is day by day becoming similar to and more standard in forms of religious life. I now come to the issue of gender, where at the very beginning I would like to state that I am talking about the Christian West only and not to other parts of the world where other forms of religious cultures predominate. I don't intend to imply that gender differences are not that important for a more detailed understanding of other populations. What I mean is that the differences take different forms into different cultures, and this is more elaborate theological and sociological understanding than is needed. To make things simple, we discuss the West only today. See, in the Christian West, the differences between men and women are very important more important in the sense that the differences are widely written about in literature. This is true of practice, of self-identification, of belief, and so on, be it small or large, traditional or innovative, Catholic or Protestant. Almost every commentator agrees on the significance of gender, and this is something that is very much relevant to religions that were initially very antagonistic towards women. It was found through various studies that few women are in senior positions in the Christian churches of the West. In this regard, the study conducted by Bernice Martin of the famous David and Bernice Martin duo in the sociology of religion 
About the position of women in Pentecostal communities of Latin America is a good example. Before that, let me define Pentecostalism. You see, Pentecostalism is actually a kind of revival movement within Christianity that emphasizes a direct and personal experience with God. This is d done through sanctification of the Holy Spirit. What is seen here is that the responsibility lies primarily on the theoretical structure that focuses on patriarchy. Many readings suggest that women should be leaving the church thanks to the patriarchal system that incapacitated their position in society. But on the contrary, available data shows something very different. That is men who are leaving faster than women. So there was not only a repeated gender imbalance in the churches, but it has become larger with every passing day. Historically, women have done more, uh, have been more jeopardized than men, whether economically or socially or physically. But hasn't this situation changed in the present day? To some extent, of course, there have been certain changes in the lives of women. Nowadays, women take part in economic activities, thereby becoming economically independent. Ultimately, what also happens is that their domestic responsibilities as childbearers and carers are also reduced. In fact, with the advent of the 20th century, what we see is that many of women's roles have been reduced. They are no longer the religious minded. They are no longer concerned about passing of religion to family and to the next generation. But there is another perspective that upheld the view that women and men have different religious needs implanted into their nature. And so there would be no change in the significance of religion. In fact, rational choice theorists also say that women are less likely to take risks in life compared to men. Men's risk taking gives them the courage to live without religion as suggested by rational choice theorists. One important factor for un the uneven religion religiousness of men and women can be attributed to the fact that women are closer both physically and emotionally to the sacred than men. Here, by sacred, I intend to mean the role undertaken by women as caregivers to children and elderly alike, a role that for ages has exclusively been the domain of women alone. In the present day, even with the medicalization of death, we can find that it is more common for women to give company to and care for the dying, whether they are paid for it or not. Linda Woodhead of Lancaster University in her study rejects the possibility of religion being a good thing or a bad thing for women. What she says is both women and the societies to which they belong are very much diverse. With this in mind, she first analyzes the societies of the modern West, particularly distinguishing characteristics of the public and private sphere. According to her, she found that for women who are homemakers and defending and upholding religiosity is actually quite easier than those who have both the public and the private spheres to pay attention to. Another interesting point she made was that the proportion of older women is higher in the spiritual domain, just as it is in more traditional forms of religion. So from Woodhead's study, it can be seen that the process of differentiation has always been less marked in the less developed parts of the world. Women, with the aim of furthering their skills and talents, have participated in both religious organizations and teachings, both in the private as well as in the public sphere. In this context, it is important to refer to David and Bernice Martin, 
who proposed that religion brings improvement and stability in the less developed nations and in turn ensures the welfare of the masses. Now see, sociology as a discipline cannot alone take into account the differences between the two sexes with respect to religious adherence and beliefs and then articulate various theories. The theories themselves must be revamped in a way to incorporate the many ways in which men and women shape as well as are shaped by various religious facets of the societies to which they belong. The last section of this module encompasses a discussion on the issue of age, life cycle, and death. You see, the issue of age is quite different from that of gender because age as a sociological category was included much later in the discipline. But once it was included in the study and analysis of religious data, it gave rise to a number of different patterns. For example, older people are commonly considered to be more religious than youth. This might be said because we see a greater propensity of older women towards religion in most countries. Let me speak of two possibilities that can be used to find out the level of religious conformity based on age differences. The first concerns the life cycle, where a closer to death individual concerns himself more with matters of morality, and the second relates to the generational outlook which have marked differences in each of them in almost every society. Apart from concepts of life cycle and generational outlooks, an awareness of the changing nature of the life cycle with its repercussions on religion becomes equally important to consider. Grace Davies' work, Religion in Modern Europe, requires special mention here. Davies writes about three factors of the changing nature of life cycle today with reference to the decline in infant mortality, adolescent ideas, and its prolongation in late modernity, as well as old age and the way it's perceived by modern people. First, let me come to Davies' infant mortality declination. Fewer infants die today in, than in any previous period. This is because of the improvement in the economy coupled with medical progress. In European societies, churches, which were once the centers of registering births and deaths, were later institutionally replaced by a professional class, which were then in charge of dealing with citizen registrations at different points of their lives. In religious terms, there was also a visible change in a newborn status, which was to have considered to have a minimal requirement of divine blessing. Second, let's discuss adolescence. The concept of adolescence has also changed with time. No longer does it simply denote the transition from childhood to adulthood, where a man gets a job and a woman gets married, but now it also focuses on the access to education and the job market for both sexes alike. We can also see that the ideas about religion have undergone wide changes with the younger generation. They become less religious than the older generation. But the younger generation have a growing inclination to experiment with new forms of religion and therefore they are more fascinated with the idea of an imminent or latent God. Not only this, but they also believe in some kind of life after death and this is most pronounced in certain parts of Europe where the historic churches have significantly weakened in their importance and thereby there's considerably less likelihood of traditional religious practices. Third, let's talk about religion and the elderly. While talking of this, a point comes to mind that there is an association between religious activity and the prolongation of life. This is because religious activities like praying, reading of holy texts, and others 
Encourage lifestyles that in turn foster healthy living. So, there's actually a kind of complementary relation between religion and improved mental and physical health of the elderly, because through religious activities, they get a sense of meaning and purpose in their life. They get a greater ability to cope with their illnesses and other difficulties and disabilities they experience. So far, I've spoken of age and also of the life cycle. Apart from these two, there's also been a revival in the sociological interest in death, dying, and dealing with your earthly remains. Here I would like to speak of the research at the University of Bath in England that has established a Centre for Death and Society in its Department of Social and Policy Sciences in September 2005. The Centre has had a number of aims, which include promoting and accelerating social, policy and health research, providing education and training for academics and practitioners, improving social policy, understanding and fostering community development. So you can well understand that for the fulfillment of these objectives, an interdisciplinary endeavor is needed that would bring together scholars from different fields such as medicine, history, sociology, psychology, social policy, religious studies, and so on. Many a time, you will find that there is a declining monopoly of religious institutions over death and death practices, mostly in developed societies. But of course, there is not always a complete withdrawal of religious services in matters of death. Had that been the case, the majority would have been offended. One simple solution might be to slow a slow evolution of the religious ceremony that contains only those attributes that are specific to the one who died and at the same time lie outside religious tradition that takes responsibility for the ceremony. In this way, the persistency of a vicarious religion can be shown in the present-day society. With this, we come to an end of the discussion of religion and daily life. We have discussed about the most important aspects of daily life, including health, health care, welfare and well-being, gender, age, life cycle and death. We have also spoken of important subjects and projects like the WREP in Europe and the one by the University of Bath in England. In most times, it is important to consider the developed nations in our society because it is from where we follow suit. Unless we obtain an understanding of the situations in developed nations, we will find it difficult in understanding the other nations of the world. Thank you.